All right, so we're gonna get started. We're gonna see who is coming on in. Let me get my screen up. Chat. Oops. You can see, why are you seeing that big screen? Sorry, I'm gonna share again. Hi, everyone. I have a slight technical difficulty for one moment. There we go. Yeah, why isn't it? Okay. Hi, everyone. It is our second to last Teen Science Cafe before we break for the holiday. Oh, my goodness. Can you believe that? That's kind of amazing. So, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, what we like to do to get started is we like to introduce ourselves. So, find the chat box and we like to know where you're from, who you are, and where you're from. So, see, we have Mariah here from Colchester. And oh, Cheyenne has a question. Yeah, so Cheyenne, we have one more cafe after today, but then we're gonna start back up in January. We have a whole new schedule ready to go. So for those of you who've never met me, I'm Lauren Traster. I'm the 4-H Teen and Leadership Program Coordinator here at UVM Extension in Vermont. I see Simon and Jack are here with us again today, and Oren's here, Sage is with us again, Emily's with us again. Oh, Scouts with us again. Oh, it's so awesome to see everyone back. Katie's here from Essex and Cheyenne from Braintree. Angus, nice to see you again, Angus. Tegan's here. Madeline, so um, Leah, just so you know, we do tend to get youth from all over the country. So Madeline's here from Illinois. We tend to get, um, we have some regulars from Maine and Rhode Island and Connecticut and Illinois that have been joining us quite regularly. So hi, Mark from Connecticut. So as you all are coming in and introducing yourselves, I am going to put in the chat in case you need the live captioning services. All you have to do is click on the link that I just put into the chat box. Um, so that is there for anybody who needs to follow along. Um, I know sometimes people need it, um, whether you need for your hearing or I know someone like me, often I like to follow along the words because I learn better that way. So if you need it, it is there for you. So as you come in, keep introducing yourselves. And I'm gonna go ahead, oops, and just remind everybody what are protocols we follow here when we're in Zoom. There's my chat, I lost my chat for a second. So I know so many of you have been here before, but we do have some new people with us today. So I wanna remind everyone, when we're here in Zoom, you all are muted, you don't have the ability to unmute yourself. So the way we communicate with one another and with our presenter is um, you can use the chat box and we also use the Q&A box. We use these things very differently. So the chat box we use, sometimes the presenter will ask you questions and that's how you're gonna respond. And sometimes you might just want to share something that you know that's related to the topic. So the chat box has to stay focused on the topic. There is no side conversations. When you use the chat box for things other than the cafe, it tends to be distracting for other people. So just stay on topic in the chat. Most of you have done a great job. If you have a question um, that's not related to the pre presentation, you can just private chat directly to me. You would just choose um, all panelists instead of to everyone. And that way you can just message me directly and not, um, not be distracting to somebody else. So when you have a question for the presenter, you would use the Q&A box. And we will get to those questions when there is, uh, when the presenter is ready to. So your question will go in there, be specific, because she might not be able to answer it immediately. And we wanna make sure we understand your question. So be as specific as, as you can. I see Emily asked a question. If you get off topic in the chat, yeah, if it really gets too distracting, I take away chat privileges, where you'll only be able to chat to me. So you know, you monitor yourself. Like, if you, if you think it's a question,
question or a comment that's not related to the presentation, don't write it. Um, and Kale is asking if, if they will be able to get the slides. Leah, are you okay if I share your slides? Yep, Absolutely. so we can send those out if you want them. Um, so we just ask that you are courteous and respectful to one another. Don't create distractions. Stay engaged, participate fully. I get this question every time. So I'm gonna tell you right now, our session goes till 4.45 today. Now, if you need to leave early, just leave early. All you need to do is click the leave button. Um, but if you're able to stay to the end, you're gonna you know, be able to hear everything and learn that entire time. So that is the schedule for today. As always, I just want to let you know about some things that are coming up. So I did say we have one more Science Cafe next week that's going to end our fall series. And then we're going to take a break. Everyone's going to hopefully have a wonderful holiday and a happy new year. And starting back on January 13th, we're going to start our winter series. And you can go online to this website that's listed below, and I'll put that in the chat box later. And you can see all the topics that we have for our winter series. And don't worry, after the winter series, there will be a spring series. I already have those topics lined up. So we're gonna be going all the way into June. My hope is this summer, we might be able to do some in-person um, stuff, but that's gonna be a to be announced later. We are gonna have a coding program that's starting in January. So if you're someone who might wanna to learn to do some coding, you can check out this program called 4-H World Changers. And we do that in collaboration with our friends in Ohio 4-H, as well as we have a computer science uh, lecturer in, that lectures at UVM. So an actual college computer science instructor works with us on that program. So it's pretty cool. So you can check that out. I always let you know our friends at the Vermont Brain Bee do a weekly program for anyone who's really um, interested in learning more about the brain and especially neuroscience. So you can always check in with them. You, you, they've been doing this, I think, for months now, but you can pop in at any time, I believe. So today's presentation is called Breaking Bad. Dub, whoop, I'm trying to open my phone and I am calling some random person because I, was, I was, thought I was um, putting my code in. <laughs> so I'm not gonna tell you on video what that was. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, today's presentation is Breaking Bad DNA Double Strand Break Repair with DNA. Oh my video. Polymerase. Poly can you say that, Leah? Polymerase. Theta. Okay. So our presenter today is Leah Dragalis. And Leah is a PhD candidate working in the lab of Sylvie Dublay at the University of Vermont. Her research is focused on the structural aspects of the DNA double strand break repair protein polymerase. I'm going to, I butchered that. They are utilizing x ray crystallography. She completed her bachelor's degree in biochemistry at the University of Colorado in Boulder in 2016, where she then worked as a lab technician before attending graduate school. So let's all welcome Leah today, and we are going to learn some cool stuff about DNA. All right. Very excited to be here. Thank you all for having me. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Share. And I've got the chat open, and I'm going to play from the start. Good. And I can see the chat, and I can see this, and I think we're all set. All right. Once again, thank you guys for having me. My name is uh, Leah Drogalis Beckham. I just got married, so I added a name. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, DNA polymerase theta and its double strand break repair activity. Um, and I know that the introduction had a lot of uh, scientific words, but we're going to get into all of them. And um, hopefully you're going to learn a lot. So here we go. All right, we're going to start with a poll because I wanna get you guys thinking. So, okay, DNA decides hair color, 
if cilantro tastes like soap to you, organ placement, cell shape, or all of the above. All right, so I'm gonna, every time we say there's a poll, I'm gonna launch a poll. So you don't write into the chat. You're gonna put your answer right into the poll that you should now see. If for some reason though, you don't see the poll, that's when you'd write it into the chat. We'll give everyone a chance to respond. So again, if you see the poll, put your answer into the poll. Only use the chat if you don't see the poll. All right. So it looks like we pretty much everyone, the majority are saying all of the above. How'd they do? All right, the answer is all of the above. So good job, everyone. I'm going to, let's see, can I close the poll? Yeah, you should be able to just X right out of it. Oh, there we go. Okay, it's, it's under the, the toolbar. Oops, oops, okay. This is... Okay, that's fine. I'll just move on. <laughs> just, just trying to technology, technology here, everyone. Okay, so yeah, the answer is all of the above. So what I wanted you to take away from this is that DNA encodes for many things that are seemingly unrelated, but DNA in your body tells your body how to make everything that there is, all of your proteins, everything that builds the cells and those cells build your body. So actually B <clears throat> is determined by a certain gene that makes uh, cilantro taste like soap to some people. I know that uh, my mother, for instance, it, cilantro tastes like soap to her. So I obviously inherited my father's uh, gene for liking the taste of cilantro, but very good. Okay, so now that we're getting warmed up, Oh, I may have just exited out of the chat. I might have to go back to that, but well, it's okay. All right, so let's talk more about DNA. We're gonna talk about the structure of DNA in particular. So I'm sure you've all heard of DNA and chromosomes before. So what is a chromosome? It's tightly wound DNA around proteins called histones that ultimately it's about six feet of DNA that can fit in the nucleus of a cell and the nucleus contains the DNA. So we have a lot of information in each cell. And this information is stored in what we call nucleotide base pairs. So the base refers to the, uh, the circle sort of shaped structure that you see here, A, T, G, on the right. And those uh, bases contain nitrogen, so we call them nitrogenous bases. And they can form hydrogen bonds with each other uh, between the DNA strands. So you have two strands of DNA and these form bonds between them. On the other end of the nucleotide, you have the phosphate and the sugar. So the backbone of DNA is phosphate sugar repeating backbone. Now, okay, perfect. I can open, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, and as the sugar and phosphates repeat, they connect to form one strand of DNA. And then when you put the strands together, they use the hydrogen bonds in the middle between the bases to stay together. So we're gonna go into another chat or another poll because um, sometimes DNA can be damaged. As you imagine, there's a number of chemical bonds and those bonds can be broken. So, Let's, let's think about this. Which type of DNA damage is the most dangerous? A single strand break, a damaged base, mismatched nucleotide, or a double strand break? And we're gonna go into what these are, but I'm just interested to see what, what you think. All right, the poll's been launched. And like I said before, if you see the poll, put your answer in the poll. Otherwise, you can put your response in the chat box. This is a tough question, so if you don't know the answer, don't feel bad. Um, there's, you're going to be learning a lot of new things today, I can promise you that. Let's see, do any more of you want to give it a try? So I can tell some people have not answered yet. And it's okay, you know, 
we don't know what you're answering. It's all anonymous. So, so give it a try. You make, make a guess. That is how you learn. Exactly. And if, you know, if we knew it all already, there'd be nothing to learn. That's so. right. It will give it about another 10 seconds. So try to put an answer in. Definitely looks like the majority are saying double strand break with a good 20% saying mismatched nucleotides. Oh, if I press share results, can they see that? Yeah, I'm already sharing results. Oh, oh okay, perfect. Just wanted to share. Okay, yeah. yes. So double strand breaks are the most dangerous uh, type of um, uh, DNA damage in the cell. Uh, mismatched nucleotides is a very good guess, though, because as you can imagine, if you mismatch a nucleotide, then you're changing the message that that DNA contains because those DNA strands should be copying each other just in opposite bases. So if you mismatch them, then you're, you're essentially changing one of the strands code. All right. So C, it's the double, or D, it's the double strand break. All right. So let's, let's talk about those types of, um, those types of damage. So a single strand break, as you can imagine, is just when the sugar and phosphate backbone, the alternation yeah. of phosphate. Yes. I am gonna interrupt you for one second because a question just came in that I think would be helpful to get an answer to. Yes. What does DNA stand for? DNA stands for, and I'm gonna go back a couple of slides if that's all right. Um, DNA stands for uh, deoxyribonucleic acid which is a mouthful. But what that is actually talking about is on the sugar, which is a ribose sugar, so that's where we get ribose, there is a position that usually, right here down at the bottom of the sugar, there's usually an, a bond to an oxygen and the hydrogen. Um, and when we don't have that bond in either of the bottom parts of the sugar here, we call that deoxy. So it's a there's no oxygen. So it's a deoxy ribo, and then it's nucleic because we find it in the nucleus. And it's an acid because when these uh, when the um, nucleotides are separate, they're actually they have a lot of hydrogens. So that's uh, very acidic. So that's where we get the name uh, deoxy ribonucleic acid. That's a very good question. Okay. I'm gonna go forward again, we did this, okay. So when we look at DNA, we see the two strands. Both of these strands are possible to be broken. It's possible for them to break. So when you have a single strand break, just one of the strands breaks. When you have a double strand break, both of them break. So then the DNA is completely separated from each other. We also have, um, Mismatch, as we talked about, if you put the wrong base, then you're changing the code that the DNA uh, contains. If you damage a base, sometimes that base uh, can't be recognized anymore, and it's hard to patch uh, or continue to translate the code. An intrastrand crosslink is when two bases next to each other decide to uh, bond. And that can be difficult because then those aren't available to bind to the other strand. And then an interstrand crosslink is when um, the bases uh, bind to each other, but um, they are chemically altered so that they can't uh, come apart. So all of these are damaging to the cell and to DNA in general. But as I as we discussed, double strand breaks are upon or one of the most uh, dangerous. So how often are you experiencing these double strand breaks if they are that dangerous? Well, let's find out. How often does the DNA in your cells experience double strand breaks? And this is per day. So we've got three breaks per cell per day, 30 breaks per cell per day, 300, or 30,000 breaks per cell per day. This is a very tricky one. All right, the poll has been launched. And again, it could be hard, but make an educated guess. See what you think, and then you'll see if you're right or not. But you'll never know unless you put an answer in. And I'll tell you this, 
I showed this to the, the members of my lab and some of them did not know the answer. So <laughs> do not worry. <laughs> All right, we got 68. Give it just a minute. All right, let's cool. see. It looks like, oh my goodness, it's a close one with it's tied tough. that the 30 and the 300, but a lot of people also said 3,000. So all of these excellent guesses. I'm going to see if I can move everything around. Here we go. It's actually 30 breaks per cell per day, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you multiply it times the number of cells in your body, which is several billion, and you think about the amount of DNA that is in every cell, it's kind of a lot, especially if they're happening at the same time. All right. So moving forward. When, you, when DNA experiences a double strand break, you've got to repair it or it's not going to be good for the cell. So there are three main ways to do this. Um, and I'm going to give you kind of the quick and dirty version of, of how those work. The first one is called um, homologous recombination. That's just its name. But basically what happens is the uh, cell uses the second half of the chromosome. So your chromosome has two identical pieces together. The cell uses the identical uh, unbroken strand of DNA and basically copy and pastes the correct, the correct uh, missing sequence back in so that you have, it breaks, but then you fix the break right away by using the other chromosome, which knows what should be there. This is the preferred method for the cell to fix the break, because if you can imagine, it maintains the code that the DNA uh, contains. It doesn't change it in any way. It is a seamless fix. The second uh, method of, of fixing the double strand break is to paste the ends together. This seems like the most obvious uh, way to fix the double strand break. However, if you have other double strand breaks in the cell at the same time, sometimes the wrong pieces can be pasted back together. So then you have a completely mismatched uh, pair of DNA and a, a break that's been repaired with a piece of DNA that is completely different than it originally had. So that can very much change the message um, that is carried by the DNA. And then the third way is to cut back uh, those flat ends and make sort of puzzle pieces that'll attach to each other and then you can paste them back together, fit them back together. So I'm going to go into more detail about uh, number three, which uh, is the what I focus on in the lab. Um, but before that, we're going to do one more, oh, we have a lot more polls, but we're going to do another poll. And this is just to see what, what you think would happen to the cell if um, the double strand break is left unrepaired. So the, we, our options are the cell dies, the cell replicates uncontrollably, the cell shrinks, or the cell grows until it bursts. All right, the poll has been launched. So let's see what you think. Nice, everybody's hopping on. Let's see, if we get a couple more people. I know there's always a little bit of a lag. There we go. And I know a couple of people went into the chat, so Perfect. we'll end yeah. the poll. And it looks like majority are thinking the cell dies. Although a fair amount said the cell replicates uncontrollably and then, you know, every answer got someone thinking it. So how'd they do? All right. The answer is the cell dies. So it looks like most of you got that. But the other answers are all very reasonable because if a double strand break is left unrepaired, you can imagine that it would have a lot of negative consequences on the cell. And all of these are things that do happen to the cell under certain conditions. So very well done, everyone. Okay. So I wanna just hit home why it's a problem to leave a double strand break unrepaired and why it's so important that we understand how they are repaired. So 
if you were to have a double strand break in one of your uh, sister chromatids, which is half of a chromosome, uh, you would not be able to replicate that um, that piece of DNA. So you can imagine you're going along replicating the DNA and then you hit a double strand break. It's just a wall. You stop because there's nothing else to copy. So that means a whole section of DNA is getting left out and is not able to uh, produce its message. Another thing to know is that the cell has what I like to refer to as little guardians who check on double strand breaks. And if they go unrepaired, they won't let the cell move on to divide. And ultimately the cell dies because it can't divide. But the double strand break uh, has to be repaired before the cell can move on. So I wanted to just really hit that home. All right. So now we're gonna move into um, a little bit more detail of how the um, break gets repaired. But I wanna see if you guys can figure out uh, what type of protein builds DNA. And we have, oops, I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there, no, you're fine. I, it was like in front of my. Um, we have nucleases, polymerases, builder aces or DNA aces? So the poll's been launched. You all know what to do. <laughs> we'll give it another 20 seconds or so. Let's try to get another one or two more answers in there. We definitely have a majority who are thinking that it's polymerases, but a good 25% think it's nucleases. So let's end the poll, share the results. How did they do? All right, so it was polymerases. So good job. Nobody got tricked by my made up uh, enzyme, which is builderases. Um, nucleases actually uh, break up DNA, they cut DNA up. Um, and DNA aces um, it would be like another word for nucleus. So good job. We call it a DNA, but good job, everyone. So now that we are sort of familiar with the word and the name polymerase, what does a polymerase look like in action? Take a look at that. Okay. So hopefully everybody can see this. So. What you are seeing here is an artist's representation of the action of a DNA polymerase. You can see that the uh, DNA feeds in as one strand, and then it, or it feeds in as two, is split into one, and then two come back out. So it's a little quick, but you can see the single strand, and then the protein moves down it, and then you see two strands. So this is just a general idea of what synthesis with a polymerase looks like. It's quick, it happens um, all at once, and it's, a, it's very, um, I like to say it's very much like an orchestra, it's orchestral, it's all synchronized at the same time to be very efficient. So polymerases can be used to replicate DNA, but they can also be used to repair DNA. But I want to ask a question first. You guys can answer this in the uh, chat box. So what do you think could happen in a cell if the polymerase duplicates DNA incorrectly? Go ahead and type in what you're thinking. And it's okay if you just have a guess. Oh yeah, and there's a ton of answers to this, so. So Jack says bad stuff will happen. He is not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Oren says it causes a mutation in the DNA. Absolutely. And Mark says cancer. Absolutely. That can be a consequence. Madeline says, I feel like a disease or maybe a mutation. And Emily says you will die. You might. <laughs> uh, KL says cells can't, uh, quote, move on. Perfect. These are great answers, everyone. You guys are really getting it. Scary. Sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> 
Any other thoughts? Anybody else want? Oh, I guess it changes something. Yeah, Jack says, I would guess it changes something. Maybe it causes something bad, something that would shut down that part of your body. Oh, sorry. It was Simon speaking. They're on together. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> no, that's very a very good point as well. So I'll, these are excellent answers. All of these were correct. Um, yeah, a lot of things can break down if the polymer. <laughs> I don't think you could grow another arm or anything. So, Madeline says, I think you could grow another arm or anything. Oh, I don't think. <laughs> so, you, an interesting point. I'm going to digress briefly because that's a very good point. But when we, I don't personally, but when people do developmental biology and they change genes in um, like fruit flies, sometimes they do get an antenna coming out of their eye. Um, you can get really weird things ha to happen uh, if you change DNA. Um, also, if the polymerase duplicates DNA incorrectly, I think you guys all kind of got at this, but it changes what the message is going to be. And so the cell may not like that. It might shut down part of that body. Maybe you're not making a protein that you need. Um, you know, there's all kinds of so you could basically die if it were through your whole body and it affected the this uh, the, the the correct um, things you could definitely uh, lose that you could lose loss of digits if it happened during development once you're uh, fully formed you're probably not going to lose the genes for your fingers because they're already there um, but yeah during develop oh <laughs> humans won't grow an antenna the fruit flies will grow an antenna. <laughs> Um, so there's lots of things that can happen during development. It's extremely important because your DNA tells your body where everything goes and how big it should be and what it should be attached to and connected to. But even every day, uh, you know, your cells are constantly making proteins that they need to survive. So if, if for any reason that breaks down, it'll have a cellular consequence. So great job, everyone. That was excellent. All right, let's move on. Okay. I think you're going to like this. Um, so let's get back to polymerase theta, which I talked about in the title. And then I talked to you about the third pathway for, uh, repairing double strand breaks. And the name for that pathway is theta mediated end joining. And the protein that does it is polymerase theta. So let's talk about how polymerase theta does its, its action on the left the less interesting part of the uh, slide, I am aware, um, has, you have two, uh, you have two pieces of DNA that have a break in the middle. You can kind of uh, use like a nuclease, or I like to think of it as like a Pac-Man, kind of comes through and eats off the, at the end so that you have little bits hanging over. And those little bits that hang over will find a, a part that matches and then they'll match up together. But sometimes the middle matching part leaves, um, <laughs> leaves a little bit of extra uh, DNA that gets cut off so that these can be uh, seamlessly stuck back together and then these gaps filled in. The, D the Lego um, that is going on on the right is just an, uh, a sort of representation of if polymerase theta is cutting out portions of the DNA, then maybe they're cutting out really important structural things like the pillar that isn't in that Lego that made it fall down. Or maybe it's something small, like it was just one small Lego block, but when you took it apart and everything else, it cascaded down. So I just wanted to include that so that you know that polymerase theta, while it fixes the double strand break, has problems of its own which we will get into uh, towards the end of the talk. But one uh, thing that I think you'd be interested in is what polymerase theta looks like. So, and there is no way that I expect you to know the answer to this. I'm just interested to see what you think. Um, polymerase theta is roughly shaped like a bean, a wiffle ball, a cactus, or a hand. All right, the poll's out. What do you think? It is shaped like, and like she said, she doesn't expect you to know. Just take a guess. Just guess, or put put what you hope it would be. Like I hope it's gonna look like a bean. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the 
we are all over. The oh, Tegan says a Shrek. See, you know, you should have had like other in the right in the other, chat. Yeah, and then like <laughs> that would have been great. So forty percent right. are saying a wiffle ball. All right, and the answer is a hand. So when I show it to you, you're going to be like, "That's a hand," but we'll get there. So. Um, all of these are possible shapes that would make sense. If you think about it, you got a polymerase, there's the protein and you got the DNA. So the DNA has got to get into the protein somehow. So, you know, a wiffle ball could look like that. So could a cactus, so could a bean. So let's take a look at what a uh, polymerase theta actually looks like. So do you see a hand? No, most people don't. When I learned this, I was, I, was certain that I was seeing it wrong or looking at the wrong picture, more like a mitten. That's good. So what you, um, what, what's going on here is if you picture a hand, and I'll do it like this. If you picture a hand like this, you have the fingers and the thumb, and then the DNA sits on the palm and the fingers and the thumb close around it. And then it can kind of chug down the DNA and uh, pump out the other the other strand or fill in the gaps uh, left by polymerase theta. It kind of does look like a half broken heart or like a monster is like trying to it's got it's got that monstery kind of look. So the way I have it shown here is um, kind of in a it's it's called space filling but it's sort of just a blob form where I'm not showing you the individual molecules. Um, and this is just so that you can get a general idea of what it looks like. But you might also be wondering, how do we know what it looks like since this is definitely something we can't take a picture of? And I am going to share with you the cool trick that my lab uses to look at proteins. But before that, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. ignore that, ignore that, I wasn't there yet. Okay. Um, so the trick, I'm going to tell you the name of what we do. So it's called x-ray crystallography. And we grow protein crystals to do this. So now I want to ask you, protein crystals contain dot, 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 untapped energy, about half of the atoms that make up the whole protein, all the atoms that make up the whole protein repeated many times, or more protein than water. All right, the poll is launched. Let's see what you know, or see what you guess. See what you think. See what you think. Part of the fun of this is, is making those educated guesses to see if you're on the right track. And if not, you're gonna learn what the correct answer is. Exactly, and feel free to guess if you have no idea, just what seems like yeah. you would like. Don't, don't say, I don't know. Just just make a, see what you think it might be. Cause you're not being graded on this. The computer's not gonna blow up if you get the wrong answer. It's just give it a try, make a guess. Also, if get you a, the answer to this, I don't think I'd have to be here. Exactly, so. let's try to get a couple more answers in. Like, I don't know, I'd have to guess. No, you will not die if you get the wrong answer. <laughs> nothing's going to break. Nothing's going to explode. This is all about just making a guess and trying to learn something. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Let's share the results. It looks like the majority are saying more protein than water, but untapped energy and about half of the atoms that make up the whole protein are also coming in close behind. Very close. All right, so you guys ready? The answer is all the atoms that make up the whole protein repeated many times. So untapped energy is, um, that, was, that was the decoy answer. <laughs> and then about half of the atoms that make up the whole protein. Um, so if we had half of the atoms that made up the protein, the, the uh, crystal would be very, very small. Um, and if when we looked at it, we wouldn't see the whole protein. But that's a reasonable guess because the, what it is, is that uh, the atoms that make up the whole protein are repeated many times. So instead of being half of them, you just have them many times repeated. 
So if you had half of the atoms, you might have to sort of extrapolate and determine what the other half look like based on what you have. But when you have all of them many times, you can get a lot of data about where they are. And you might be wondering, how do you get this data? And, and here we go. <laughs> and the next part, I do not expect you to understand the first time. So please, please, please ask any questions that you have. Okay. So let's talk about crystals and protein crystals and how they form very quickly. But I'd like to uh, compare this to something that you're familiar with, which is snowflakes. And I like to call those crystals in the clouds because in the cloud, you nucleate or seed a snowflake with a drop of conden or frozen condensed water. In a protein, you seed or nucleate the drop with a little bit of your protein. So then you, you can grow them over time, continually adding to them like you would a snowflake as it falls through the, in, through the atmosphere. And in a protein drop, we put uh, specific chemicals in with the protein that we think will help it crystallize. So if you change the environment constantly as with a snowflake falling through the atmosphere, you get uh, projections and branches and all sorts of cool designs because everything's constantly changing. And that's why every snowflake is unique because it all experiences a different path through the atmosphere. However, a protein crystal, you want to keep very stable so that you form a very uniform type of crystal. And what you, as you can see on the right, instead of being very intricate and uh, sort of like a design almost, they're very uh, kind of cubic. They're a little uh, unusual, but uh, they're very tight and uniform. And that's what we like to see when we look for a protein crystal. But what do, what, what do we do with these? Why do we need protein crystals? First, we're going to find out how long it takes to get a protein crystal. This one, I'm interested to see what you think, because this is also, you know, a, a hard one to know, but very interesting. So how long does it take protein crystals to grow? One day, three months, one year, two weeks, all the above. I don't want to see I don't know in the chat. I want everybody to make a guess. It really does not matter if you guess the right answer or not. This is how you learn by making a guess. And then if you're right, great. But if not, you're going to learn what the correct answer is. So give it a try. The poll is up. If you see the poll, put your answer in the poll. Looks like we got a good majority saying all of the above. And? You are correct. So if you said one day or three months or two weeks, you are not wrong. Um, all of these are correct answers. Um, the crazy thing about protein crystals is that it, when, you, when you grow a protein crystal, you put the protein with a lot of different chemicals. And you, the way we do it in my lab is you put it on a piece of plastic and you just hang it over a little uh, well that's full of the chemicals that you have with the protein. Leah? Yes. Can I stop you for one moment? Mark asked a good question in the chat, and I'm afraid if you keep going on your answer, it won't make nope. sense. Can you just back up just a tad? Yep. How did you go from broken DNA to making protein crystals? How are they related? <laughs> Okay, that's a very good question, and that's, that's my bad. Um, so they're related because the broken DNA has a protein that fixes it, and we need to know what that protein looks like so that we know what it does. And the way we look at it is by growing protein crystals. If you have more questions, please go ahead and type them in. If that, okay, great, that cleared that up, perfect. I'm sure yeah, so you- I think now the explanation of this will make more sense. Well, yeah, that's- I should have listened to my mom when she gave me that critique. Anyway. <laughs> okay, perfect. I'm glad that you asked that though. Um, so we're, this is the process that our lab goes through to determine what the protein that fixes the DNA looks like. Um, what does it look like? How do we know what it does? We need to know what it looks like to know what it does. So, oh, 
I'm going to go back. Okay. So yeah, protein crystals can take a variety of times to grow depending on the protein, depending on what chemicals you put it with, the temperature, the humidity, the time of year, um, how hard you breathed on it that day. Um, a lot of a lot of things change crystals and how long they grow. Um, so we do a lot of being very patient and a lot of waiting and checking and waiting and checking. Um, and it can be it can be hard to grow a protein crystal. It could take a lot of trial and error. Um, but when you get it, it's very important. So let's go into um, one one more example for the crystals, just so you guys have a night a good idea of what's happening. I know the snowflake made sense, but I know that many of you have probably grown rock candy before, where you dissolve sugar in hot water so that the, the water's full of sugar, and you put the string in, and then you wait, and the sugar clings to the string, and uh, and you and you grow rock candy. Um, so this is very similar to, to protein crystallography because you use the string as a seed and you put it in a solution that has a lot of what you want to form a crystal in it. And then when the crystals start to form, they form on top of each other and they're kept uniform because they're in the same solution. So I, and I'm saying ideally because some people have said in this chat that their rock candy did not work. So, um, Ideally, you get the, the candy grows on itself and it looks really regular. You get like cubes and other little sort of square shapes. Uh, and that's what we're going for with protein crystallography. It's basically the same thing that you're seeing here with the rock candy. Yes, rock candy is edible. It's not rock. Okay, so here's a question for you guys to chat in. What factors do you think may influence the rate of crystal growth? I gave you some of them. However, there are more that I did not say. So this is one, use your imagination. What do you think is the craziest thing that could affect how long a crystal grows? Metabolism. Yeah, you could have the, the protein that you're using. Maybe you gave it something that it can metabolize, you know, maybe temp, exactly. Concentration of the solution, great one. Yeah, ratio of sugar to water. So in protein, it would be ratio of protein to everything else. Uh, amount of protein put into, yes, exactly. Temperature, pollution. I, You know, that would be a great, something that would be great to test, to set crystals in uh, like a very polluted place and um, then also in, in a very pure place. That would be very interesting. Um, motion and condensation, both very true. Uh, we keep our, our crystals in incubators that are not to be disturbed because if they shake, it might disrupt the crystal growth. Yep, motion. These are all excellent. I'm so thrilled with this, everyone. I just want you to know. I'm having so much fun. Uh, you know, smell, maybe. There could be something in the, in the atmosphere. Who knows? Maybe there's a gas leak and there's, you know, there's something in the atmosphere that is affecting the rate of evaporation. That is a good point. Disease probably wouldn't affect the um, crystals because they're isolated. The protein is pure and we, they're not in a cell. Um, but disease would definitely affect if it was in the cell. Uh, Light, sometimes we crystallize proteins with um, DNA that, that is a bright color that fluoresces. So uh, we have to keep that in the dark or we'll lose that light that it gives off. Yeah, light, oxygen, carbon fibers. That's a very interesting point. Sometimes we, uh, to get protein crystals, you know, I mentioned you have to seed them. So sometimes just putting protein in the drop is not enough. Sometimes you just don't it's it doesn't it doesn't it come out of the liquid like you want it to so we actually use things like cat whiskers and um cat whiskers is the main one uh, but also like uh thin thin fibers to draw a streak of protein through um a drop of liquid and then let it grow. And sometimes when you use the cat whisker, because the whisker picks up so much protein, it'll put it down in just the right amounts that that allows crystals to grow. So that, I didn't, I wasn't planning on going into streak seeding, but you guys got there. So <laughs> that's something that we do. 
Absolutely. Yes, yeah, snow and ice. If it's a very snowy uh, winter, um, it can. What cat did you put? We typically wait until we have a just a lab member who has a cat, and then they're responsible for finding their cat's whiskers. We have them stored from a previous member who had many cats. So um, let's move forward. Okay. I'm going to give you all two seconds because I have to grab my computer charger and I want you to take a look at these pictures and then I want you to think and you can put it in the chat and I'll look at it when I when I come back. What do you think is the best looking crystal on this on this page with you just put whatever the uh, description is next to it. So you've got clear drop, skin, precipitate, phase, quasi, micro crystals, needle cluster, plates and rod cluster. I'm going to grab my chair. Sorry about that. So what do you think the best looking crystal is? See, we have rod cluster. So Simon says rod cluster. Mark says rod cluster. I don't, some of the names don't show up. So I apologize if I don't say your name out loud, but rod cluster. And then we have clear drop, needle cluster, phaser clear. A bunch of you are saying, are, are saying rod cluster. Uh, Madeline says skin precipitate. Egan says clear drop. I would say based on just quickly reading what was written in, there was a, probably a majority that said rod cluster, but definitely clear drop, skin precipitate was there. And I think I saw needle cluster was there. Great, okay, these are, these are great answers. So <clears throat> all of these that, I, that you see on the left are uh, crystals that we would consider um, that they could be better, basically, that we could do something to make them better. So change the chemical that the protein's with or something like that, that will uh, change the way it crystallizes and hopefully make it more, um, more uniform, less, less branching. So the rod cluster is probably the best one here. Um, I'm gonna run through them really quick so you know what they refer to. Um, we have the clear drop is, is the protein has not done anything. Skin slash precipitate is usually um, when it's dried out a little bit. It's perhaps it was open to the air for too long and it lost some water. Precipitate is when the protein comes out of the solution and doesn't form a crystal, which happens. Sometimes it just comes out of the protein in no order and, it, and there you don't get a crystal. Um, and we deal with a lot of that. Um, the precipitate slash phase and the quasi crystals are when protein starts to crystallize, but it doesn't quite get there. It's sort of, sort of still squishy. It's not quite uh, uniform entirely. Microcrystals are when we um, get teeny tiny crystals, but enough of them start that they take up too much room, so none of them can get actually big. And then needle cluster, plates, and rod cluster are as those microcrystals start to become a little bit larger. They'll kind of grow off in different directions. And here you can tell that obviously the conditions changed at some point because they, they grow in different directions like a snowflake. Um, so they were not fully uniform, whether that was the something evaporated uh, more than something else and it changed what the protein was seeing. Uh, many things can, can happen. Okay. On, oh, also on the right, those are some of my drops that I've actually collected um, or that I've set. Uh, on the top is, you can see some quasi crystals on top of precipitate. And on the bottom is when I shine a UV light on them. Um, they, uh, proteins are UV active. So we can tell if something is um, actually the protein or not based on if it glows under UV light. Um, Okay, hold on. Has the polymerase duplicating DNA incorrectly actually happened to a human? And if so, what was the effect? I'm going to answer that real quick. Um, yes. Uh, 
polymerases incorrectly duplicate DNA every day, but you have a number of proteins in your cell that are uh, designed to deal with that and to uh, make sure that the cell either dies so that the incorrectly uh, copied DNA doesn't go on, or they make sure that the DNA gets fixed. Um, there are consequences of this happening, and I I'm about to go into them. Okay. Okay, so you may have heard me say x-ray crystallography, and you're probably thinking, what do we do with the x-rays? This is a rhetorical question, so we're not going to answer this. <laughs> okay, what do we do with the x-rays? So we take an x-ray machine. I'm sure you're familiar with x-rays from having uh, bones looked at. And we shoot the x-ray at a protein crystal. So when you shoot an x-ray at your body, it goes through like your skin and muscles, and, but can't go through your bones. In this case, the x-ray goes through the crystal, but it hits the, the, protein, the protein molecules and sends reflections of the beam. So if it were to hit it and then come off at that angle, it's going to hit the detector so that you get this pattern of spots based on how the protein uh, sits in the sits in the um, in the X-ray. So with the diffraction pattern, this is this looks fun. And back in the day, uh, when there weren't computers, you had to do the next step by hand. But now that we have computers. We can take this and the darkness of each spot and how far out from the center the spots are and the placement of the spots gives you all the information you need to know about what the protein in that crystal looks like. So just a quick example for you. Um, here's a diffraction pattern with different density spots. So the ones that are really dark means that as you were turning the crystal in the x-ray beam, the x-ray just kept hitting those atoms and bouncing off and forming the same reflection. So you, you know really well the location of that atom. The ones that have smaller dots means that they were not being hit as often. So they might be towards the periphery of the protein or they may have been uh, not in the very center. And I'm going to tell you this right now, this takes years of study to fully understand. So if you don't completely grasp it, you are not alone. <laughs> I'm still working on it. So, <laughs> all right. So once you have put that diffraction pattern that I just showed you with those reflections into a computer, you get what we call an electron density map. So what that is, is when you hit an atom with the x-ray, it excites its electrons. So we, based on where the reflection is and, and the angle that it, it hit the detector at, we can tell where those electrons are. And when you put that diffraction pattern through a lot of complicated math and many uh, computer programs, you get this uh, density map. So the density map is kind of like a glove that fits the DNA. Um, you can see on the right that once you have that sort of glove, you can put in, you, you know what the protein is, you know how many, um, what the protein should be, the sequence of the protein rather, and you can fit it, slide it into the glove that you've created, hopefully, if you're, if you're, uh, crystal and your diffraction pattern is good. Um, I'm going to show you an example of how this changes, but so on the left you can see that the diffraction pattern for this crystal is very close to the center, um, and that means that it's not a uh, very high resolution. So the glove that's created for the protein is kind of loose. It does, you might think that this part of the protein goes in there, but another part might also look like it fits. You can fit multiple things into the glove, which is not what we want. So as the uh, resolution it, it becomes better, which happens by having better crystals and collecting more data, the diffraction pattern expands, and that indicates that you have um, data that is closer together. So you can, you can see in the middle, it, the glove gets a little bit better. It's closing around it a little bit more. And then in the end, you can even see the hole in the middle of that ring, which is a really good resolution. So that's what we're always trying to get for in crystallography. So what I want you to understand about this is we shoot x-rays at a protein crystal, and then we get data. And we take that data 
put it through some mathematical processes, and we get the shape of the protein. And because we know what the protein sequence is, we can put the sequence into the shape that we got, like putting a hand in a glove, and that should tell us what, what it looks like. Um, so that's sort of the goal of what we're doing here. And I do that with polymerase theta, which repairs the double strand breaks. So to just finish this up real quick about why do we care about polymerase theta and double strand breaks? You guys in the chat have been done a great job of pointing out the different um, issues that might be might occur because of this. So we've talked about the, the problems that come with not repairing double strand breaks, but sometimes repairing a double strand break is almost as bad as not repairing it. And that's what I'm going to show you right now. So when you use a uh, polymerase theta to repair a double strand break, uh, often as we talked about, the message of the DNA gets changed, pieces are lost. Um, so I'm gonna show you guys some actual data. This is from a clinical publication. Um, on the left and the right, it's just two different groups of people. The blue line shows people who uh, did not have high levels of polymerase theta, and the green line is people who had high levels of polymerase theta. And people with high levels of pol theta in their breast cancer actually had a decreased survival than those who had low, um, low levels of pol theta in their breast cancer. And that's because when polymerase theta repairs the double strand break, because it's not the same, exactly the same, it changes genes that suppress tumors and fight cancer. So then that cell is now able to become cancerous because it, it has uh, inactivated basically the genes that were telling it to not be cancerous. So then you have an issue where your cell is now mutated. And just like everyone mentioned, this is why I was so impressed with your answers, cancer can form, disease can happen. You have a lot of issues when you repair the break, but the repair isn't done well. So this can also be seen, this is, this is cool, I think you guys will like this. So uh, polymerase theta is also a player in Chagas disease, which I will tell you now is endemic to South America, so don't worry, you're, you're good in Vermont. Um, it's transmitted by a bug that bites your face and then um, and takes some blood and leaves a wound and then uh, defecates and you wipe it away, you wipe the bug away from your eye and you uh, move the defecation into the wound and that's where the parasite is. So the parasite enters the wound and is in your bloodstream. Um, now there is a player of the immune system in the body called a macrophage, which is, I'm going to bring up Pac-Man again, but it's kind of like a Pac-Man. He eats everything it gets rid of debris and waste and things like that and foreign foreign things as well. So when something like a parasite enters the bloodstream, the macrophages are all over that. They want to eat that up and get rid of that. So they engulf the, the uh, parasite. And the parasite, when it is expressing polymerase theta or has a lot of polymerase theta, can actually resist the macrophage trying to eat it and instead just replicate inside the macrophage as almost like a safe place. And then uh, when it's replicated enough, as you can see up here, it bursts into the back into the bloodstream and then can infect other parts of the body. But the key here is that this parasite may be using polymerase theta to avoid being eaten by the macrophage. So then the disease continues and your body hasn't cleared it because you still have the um, parasite. So here's another instance when not repairing the double strand break that might be caused by the macrophage would be a better option than repairing it with polymerase theta. So this parasite is, has a very huge advantage over the human body by having upregulated polymerase theta. So basically, and this is, this is my last plug and then we're gonna do questions, is, um, Basically, what we do is we look for ways to stop polymerase theta so that it does not repair double strand breaks and then allow cells to become cancerous or avoid uh, being handled by the immune cells. We want to stop polymerase theta because sometimes a dead cell is better than a living incorrect cell. 
because they can often go on to be much more dangerous. And with that, I'll just have an acknowledgement slide. My lab is in the bottom right. That's us being uh, very 2020. Um, and I would love to hear your questions. There already are some questions. Yeah, so let, keep that acknowledgement slide up. And before okay. we go into questions, I'm just gonna throw up one final poll because we always get feedback um, before we go to final questions. So the poll has been launched. There's two questions, just overall rating, the Today's Cafe, and then rating the knowledge that you gained today. So what did you learn? And it's a one to five scale. So if you felt like you learned a lot, put a five. And if you felt like, ah, oh, I knew this stuff, I didn't learn anything, you'd put a one. I'd be surprised if anybody did not learn something today. And once we get your answers in here, we'll go to the questions that have been building in the Q&A. Um, you can also put some questions in there. Um, we do have 10 minutes to go, so I think we'll be able to get to all of the questions. Uh, I'm going to ask a few more of you to make sure you do this poll. It's really important we get this feedback um, because it just helps us know what's going on. I do see a couple of you have put in, um, make sure your questions go in the Q&A box. So I see a couple of questions went into the chat. Just copy and paste those right into the Q&A box. That's where we're going to be um taking the question so i am going to stop the poll thank you and let's go into the q a box so again if you put a question in the chat please move it over to the q a box that is what we're going to be working out of right now so first question about how many cells are in a child's head if you know <laughs> i'm going to be honest i don't um if i had to guess I don't have a good guess. <laughs> and you know, I think it's always important to say you don't know. If yeah, you don't I know don't know. That. It's, it's not your area. So yeah, we'll so, yeah, I don't do a lot with the brain. Um, but that's a very good question. And you know, there are probably a lot of brain cells that are affected by polymerase theta. So yeah, a good thought. Uh, so DNA with oxygen, is that RNA? So DNA with oxygen in uh, one particular place on the sugar is RNA. Yes, the only difference between DNA and RNA um, in terms of its structure is that oxygen and hydrogen. There's also, uh, sometimes the base can be different, but uh, largely the main structural difference is that uh, oxygen and hydrogen, so yeah. Nice. Can an unrepaired double strand break be fatal? To the cell, yes. I imagine that if you had like, all over your body a lot of unrepaired double strand breaks that that would end up being fatal if your body really had no way to repair those um but if left completely unrepaired yes it would be fatal based on the number of breaks that your cells experience every day how do these breaks happen are they caused by a bodily dysfunction or are they caused by the environment like twisting your ankle or breaking something wouldn't that be crazy if you could just break your dna oh man that would be that would be a wild world this is a great question um so they are caused by a number of things but metabolism in the cells so different products produced by the cell will break dna radiation uh from the sun especially um but also uh, radiation from throughout our world. Uh, a, the, a number of things can, can break DNA, uh, but it's not, it's usually not a physical breakage. It's some sort of chemical or, um, yeah, it's usually a, a chemical or a physical reaction. It's not, we wouldn't like physically break the DNA, uh, but that was an excellent question. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Uh, KL's asking, uh, with this data, what are your goals to improve this particular field of medicine? Any projects or proposals that your lab or other labs are working on? Ooh, this is an excellent question. So um, our goals are to uh, hopefully, uh, our, our largest goal is with breast cancer, to develop uh, inhibitors or chemicals that stop the action of polymerase theta. Uh, to, to use as a secondary treatment in breast cancer. So if you were to um, uh, treat a breast tumor with um, 
radiation that causes double strand breaks. That's what the radiation does. And if you also disabled pulse theta, then there would be very few ways to fix that double strand break and those cells would die. So hopefully we're going to use that as what we call an adjuvant to current cancer treatments. Um, there's also, uh, we work with five other labs on something that's called a program project, which is just a very large grant. Um, and we uh, are working uh, with all of them on doing different aspects of um, of developing this inhibitor. So some, some labs do work in cells. Our, our lab works, uh, it's called in vitro, so out of cells. Um, and we have other labs that do uh, work in animals as well. So it's really scaled up uh, within the program project. It's pretty cool. That was a good question. Yeah. Was, this is great. Uh, so how did the first person originally look in a cell? You can't cut it because it's too small, right? So the first, I believe the first cells that were looked at were um, like wood cork um, or cork, not cork cells because they're kind of large and porous and you can see them uh, with a rudimentary microscope. Um, but it would be very difficult to cut the cell itself, largely because the cell, everything in it is like squishy and, and floating around. It's not like tied down. It's, it's tied to each other, but it's not like tied down, if that makes sense. Um, but to, to look at, at cells themselves, usually we use uh, pretty advanced microscopes now, um, whereas we're looking at the protein out of the cell. So we do it with, with x-ray crystallography. Uh, but I would say typically a, a high-powered microscope is how most people look at cells these days. Um. What bug causes the Chagas disease? It's called a triadamine bug, but it's also known as the kissing bug because it bites you on your face. I love it. it sounds so innocent, the kissing bug. I know. Bug, and it can just do such damage. Oh, it's, yeah. How do you get the protein um, out in the first place? Great question. Okay, so we... Um, oh, can you just say the question over again? Just oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. How do you get the proteins out in the first place, like to start the crystals with? So we grow the um, we grow cells that produce the protein um, in E. coli. We use E. coli cells to do this, and then once the cells have grown and we've made them make the protein, which we do, um, it's it's pretty complicated, but we we make them make the protein. Then we take the cells and we put it through a bunch of steps of purification to get rid of all the stuff that isn't the protein that we want. And every step of purification is based on the properties of the protein we want. So we want to separate it from everything else. So maybe our protein has a positive charge at this pH. That'll separate it from all the, the negatively charged things, you know. And so we do like four to five steps of that, and then we get a pure protein and, that we can use for the crystals. Um, that is, I would say, probably the majority of my lab work is purifying proteins. Nice. We have two minutes left, and we have three questions that are all a little related, so let's take them as a group. Perfect. So is the pole theta thing in every cell? And what is the least deadly thing cells can deal with? And has the polymerase, oh, a last question just came in. Okay, no more questions. Has the poly, um, I can never say the word, but you know what I'm saying. Duplicating DNA incorrectly actually happened to a human, and if so, what was the effect? And then the okay. last that just came in, what's the most deadly virus a cell can deal with? Those are all connected. So let's wrap that up in a nice bow in our final two minutes. All right. So is, is pole theta in every cell? Yes. Um, it is in every uh, what we call somatic cell. So I thought it's probably in germline cells too. Yes. The answer is yes. Um, what is the least deadly thing cells can deal with? Um, of the DNA damage, probably a mismatch it can be pretty easy to repair, mostly because when you mismatch nucleotides, it makes the DNA like stick out weird and, and proteins can see that and they fix that very quickly. Um, so that's a pretty, a pretty uh, 
not as, I mean, they're all dangerous, but not as dangerous. What is the most deadly virus a cell can deal with? Ooh, that I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to be honest on that one. I don't know. And I don't want to get the wrong idea in your head. <laughs> is the polymerase has the polymerase duplicating DNA incorrectly actually? Oh, yes, absolutely. So that was um, in the last couple slides when I talked about the, uh, the breast cancer incidences. Um, there are lots, uh, a number of genetic diseases that occur because of um, one to two mutations in a gene that because you change one protein or one, um, one part of the DNA, it can, it can change what is expressed. And sometimes it's a protein that you need to live. So absolutely, uh, incorrectly rep, uh, replicated DNA does occur, it does occur in humans and can be quite detrimental. Well, that was all of our questions and we are right at 445. So let's all thank Leah for sharing her knowledge and her work with us today. It was really fascinating. I always, love all of the questions you ask. I always tell our presenters, you're going to be surprised. This group asks such amazing questions and you all did not disappoint again today. So remember, we have our final uh, cafe for the fall season next Wednesday. Next week's topic is biomimetic membranes and nanotechnology. So hopefully we'll see you all there um, and everyone have a good rest of your week.